Well, come on in, folks. Come around this fire with me. It's a nice spring evening, and gosh, it's beautiful. The stars are out. I seen a couple of shooting stars here not too long ago. Get yourself something to drink in your mug. There's some of that chicory coffee over there by the fire if y'all need some. And there's a bottle going around, so don't be shy. You guys all remember that story we was telling you last week about Thomas Robinette, the Bigfoot hunter. Joe Flippo, one of our listeners, he's been here before with us, he wrote that. and It's worth reading some more of. We're going to go to chapter 5 tonight and see how y'all like it. It's, uh, the name of this chapter is Base Camp. Now y'all get seated and here we go. It was later in the afternoon when the team finally reached the forward base camp. The jet lag and the time zone changes made Thomas feel like he was suspended in time. He was absolutely fatigued from the day's activities. He was really feeling his middle age today after all the events that began with a repeated set of phone calls. It wasn't until they took the helicopter to the base camp on the eastern end of Paradise Creek, where the creek forked to go both north and south, that Thomas even had a chance to rest his eyes for a couple of winks. Jack, his ever attentive and loyal partner in adventure and misadventure alike, was right there by his side the entire journey since exiting the plane in Portland. Jake, while wearing his service vest, was allowed to enter any business that Thomas entered. Since landing, their fast-paced hide-and-seek game took them all across the city searching for appropriate equipment and last-minute personal items. This day had really stimulated Jake's sense of smell, hearing, taste, and sight. He really felt more like an excited puppy learning to chase a ball than a highly trained working dog. Today's game was protecting his alpha, and he was really having a blast. When the helicopter finally landed at camp, assistants waiting on their arrival began unloading the cargo hold. Thomas was amazed at how many personnel were actually on site. His anticipation of the main camp was on par with maybe a hunting trip or, or even a large semi-permanent tent with supporting smaller ones at most. What he actually saw when he arrived was a bustling micro-city planted in the middle of the wild, complete with generators for light and technology, temporary filtered plumbing to various restrooms and shower houses, a communication tent where everyone was updated hourly over ear communication devices, a fully functioning mess hall, and quite adequate and comfortable campers to accommodate the 200 searchers. There was even a military-style public exchange. As soon as the occupants of the helicopter stepped onto the ground, they were converged upon by the various operations chiefs, uh, who were eager to give Emery their updates. He raised his hand and hushed them. When he had their attention, he announced there was going to be a full debrief and coordinated information update within the next half hour, and he expected everyone to report then. After he dismissed them, he took Thomas directly to a medium-sized tent that was erected to accommodate his needs. Now, inside that tent, there was every topographical map available of the area, including one that was digital and updated every quarter hour via satellite. He had maps of the current wildlife migratory patterns for the last five years on a computerized large screen, playing the patterns of different animals and color-coded line for various species. Everything that Thomas had asked for was there and organized so that Thomas only had to stand in the middle of the tent and turn around and he could see any data that he required at any given moment. Thomas was in awe. Some of the information that he had asked for present was just a wish list. Well, this is your workstation, Thomas, Emery announced. Outside in the rear is the camper for your convenience, accommodations, and comfort. I made sure that Jake would have everything that he needs as well. At that moment, a photogenic Native American woman about five feet and two inches tall entered the room with a tall Native American man could have been her twin except for the fact that he was male and 14 inches taller than her. He was a large man with a high forehead and a square jaw. He was quite stout and he held his head up with pride. His well-tanned skin and ease of movement spoke of his competence and hinted at his life spent outside in the wild. When he saw Emery, she instinctively moved close to him, invading his personal space. Her companion stood beside the entrance of the tent. Emery, she glowed. You made it back in time, I see. 
Yes, Crystal, he answered her. This is Thomas Robinette. This is the man that I went to Mississippi to recruit to help us find the Sinclair party. Wonderful, she sparkled. I also brought someone that you asked me to find here. Crystal gestured for her companion to join the group. And my cousin, James Stone, we call him Jimmy. You asked for the best tracker I can find? Well, here he is. Jimmy is without question the best tracker of the entire confederation of coos. He is from my family among the lower Umpqua people. Hello, Mr. Stone. Emery stuck out his hand to offer to shake James Stone's hand. Hello, Mr. Letson, James Stone answered without taking his hand. After about five seconds of awkward silence, James Stone grabbed Emery's hand and shook it solidly. Don't let Jimmy fool you, Emery, Crystal said. He has a master's degree in conservation and wildlife, a minor degree in botany, and a great interest in geology. So if he tells you something, you can rest assured that his information's accurate. Don't let him pull your leg about a bird telling him something or that he overheard a couple of grasshoppers gossiping. As long as you have good information, Emery stated to James, I don't care if a rabbit farted it to you in Morse code. Turning to Thomas, Emery introduced him to Jack. When Thomas told Jack to sit, James bent down on Jack's level and spoke to him. Hello, little brother, he said. If you and I are going to travel together some, you may as well call me Jimmy as well. Then he looked at Thomas, stuck out his hand, and introduced himself as Jimmy Stone. After the introductions were complete, Emery invited the group to join him in the conference trailer for the information update. The update went as usual with no major breakthroughs until the search chief entered the room tardily. He had the look of anticipation on his face mixed with a tone of uncertainty. The search chief notified everyone that the Sinclair's last known camp was finally found. He stated that it looked like a war zone without giving any details. He had also lost contact with the search team who found the camp. However, the coordinates were relayed before the lost communications. His opinion was that the topography must play a part in the loss of communications as that had been an ongoing obstacle since they'd arrived and set up the camp. He requested that Emery allow him to get a search and rescue team together with trained dogs to go to the location to see if the dogs could track the lost party. Well, everyone began talking all at once. Finally, Emery got control of the energized crowd. He took the time to inform his crew that Thomas had agreed to come here to offer his expert advice and that he would naturally lead the search party. After a bit of objection and arguing, Emery finally told everyone that Thomas was the Sinclair party's best opportunity for a successful return. He directed his subordinates to work with Thomas as if he were the boss because their boss had personally asked for Thomas to find his grandchildren. Now that statement pretty much squashed any further discussions. As Emery ended the meetings, he informed the chiefs that they would be notified when their teams were needed and to keep their radios charged. With that, he dismissed everyone but Thomas, Crystal, and Jimmy. Thomas, Emery addressed him. I'm counting on you to pick your team. Everyone on location is an expert in their field. Since Lacey returned to Memphis, I'm going to assign Crystal as your assistant on site here. She has excellent logistic capabilities and is a good team member to have on the mic when shit hits fan. Assemble your team. You have access to anything and any personnel on this base. If you need anything more, that's just one question away from you. I will leave you to your task at hand. If you need anything, Emery said as he left out the door. Thomas's first call was the search chief, Tommy Hennessy. Thomas needed the exact coordinates for him to make his decision properly. When he re-entered the tent, the coordinates of the camp were already pinned on his topo map screen. Hennessy had sent them as soon as his team had put them into the base-wide computer system. Several color-coded lines of travel outlined the most probable routes that would take that team either overland or by helicopter to the Sinclair Party's camp. Thomas picked up a pre-programmed satellite phone with all the base's contact information and texted a Thank you for cords to Hennessy. Satellite images were coming in on another widescreen monitor. Although the map had changed from daylight imaging to night vision green, it was still very clear. 
All around the immediate vicinity of the camp, there were broken trees, flipped tents, broken equipment, and debris scattered everywhere. In Thomas's mind, it looked like a Category 2 hurricane had sat down on the camp and dissipated before moving on. He looked over at Jake and scratched his ears. He reconnoitered the area via satellite images. As he zoomed in on vague impressions on the ground, he suddenly realized that he needed to be there on scene immediately. As he ran out of the tent with his phone to his ear, Jake followed close to his heels. Within 15 minutes, he called to various team chiefs were made. His team was assembled and they were waiting on a helicopter to come and pick them up. The helicopter en route was a Boeing CH-47 Chinook. The plan was to load the whole team onto the Chinook, fly them to within 100 meters of the Sinclair camp, land, offload equipment and personnel, then leave to provide any logistical support that the team may need, evaluating either survivors or cadavers. The pilot had orders to return to base camp as it was only a 15-minute flight from there to the rediscovered camp. Thomas had chosen his team well. The first thing that he did was locate Owen Filippo and Easton Gray. After questioning them, he decided that he was better off letting Owen choose the security detail that would accompany them. Each security operative there was trained by him at one time or another. He knew each man's strengths, he knew each man's weaknesses, and how much stress that individual could stomach. The only requirement that Thomas insisted upon was that the men had picked had to be ones that could look at the impossible without freaking out. Three minutes later, Owen had eight other men with him and Easton on standby waiting with their equipment at the landing zone. Next, Thomas contacted the medical chief and asked for two medics with combat deployment experience to report to the landing zone with the proper equipment to triage and treat any possible survivors. He requested that they be prepared and trained to perform surgical procedures in the back of the Chinook if necessary. Then, Thomas texted Crystal and asked her to get Jimmy to report to Owen Filippo and for him to bring whatever he needed with him. If he required anything else, Owen would get it for him. He also asked Crystal to send over an ear comm for him and since he hadn't had the chance to acquiesce one before then. On his way to the landing zone, Thomas stopped in the PX and inquired about a shotgun. Unlike the rest of his team, he didn't have military training and he felt uneasy around the unfamiliar rifles that the retired soldiers just seemed to love. The attendant there showed him an Atchison assault shotgun. He then took Thomas over to the military-grade ammunition. He informed Thomas that he only had four drum magazines that carried 32 rounds, other than the one already on the shotgun, but that if he wanted them, he could have them. They were preloaded with 27 full metal sabotage slugs. The last five shots were tracer rounds to let him know that he would need to change the drum out. Then he recommended that Thomas take two bandoliers of extra ammunition with him so that he could reload his shotgun if necessary. Any other time, Thomas would have protested, but that wasn't an option then. So he followed the attendant's advice, got a combat vest to hold the four 32-round drums, two bandoliers to hold the extra ammo, a lighter, a tactical million lumen flashlight, and a K-bar knife, which he strapped upside down on his vest for easy access. What he wasn't prepared for was the M203 single-shot 40 millimeter grenade launcher attached under the barrel of the shotgun. He remained silent as the attendant showed him the Cliff Notes version of how to shoot it. He also attached the ammo to Thomas's vest and showed him how to release them. He told Thomas, think about it as an automatic football thrower, if he needed to actually fire the thing for long distance. He explained that the 40 millimeter projectile arches are similar to how a football arches downrange. Then, the attendant clipped half a dozen high explosive grenades to his chest, just in case. And before he walked to the landing zone, Thomas called Sarah on the phone. It was his and her tradition that before he went out into the woods at night that he would always call her, tell her that he loved her, that everything was going to be all right, and he would talk to her and the children on the phone in the morning. She would worry about him all night if he didn't call her, so he did. Hello, Sarah answered the phone before the first ring could complete. Hey, sweetheart, Thomas said cheerfully. I'm about to go out and walk in some mountains tonight. Mountains? Sarah asked. Where are you? 
Oh, I meant to tell you earlier, Thomas stated. Emery Letson flew me and Jake out to Oregon. He wants me to check out some of their company's land and give an assessment of their probability of having some old men of the woods up here. Oh, Lord, Sarah huffed. You're in Oregon? Shouldn't it be given that he had them out that way? I mean, it's in the Pacific Northwest. Well, at least you have Jake to keep you safe. Right, Thomas answered. He's the brains of this outfit, and I'm the good-looking one. Thomas told her that he loved her, to kiss the boys for him before they go to sleep, and not to think about him while he was gone. He could hear Sarah smile as they said good night. Thomas knew that his wife wasn't complaining. Since he had been sent a truck by one of his new friends from Asia, she took a different outlook on his spur the moment departure. He also knew that she was already in the middle of figuring out how they were going to spend his NDA contract bonus. They had made an agreement when they got married that she could take all the minor decisions that, that they came across in their lives and he would make all the big decisions. Two homes and three cars later, he still hadn't had a major decision to make. He smiled at that thought as he hustled down to the landing zone with Jake on his heels. As he arrived, the Chinook was just about to land, and Emery was just making it there as well. We're going to go and look over the camp and see what we can find, Thomas yelled over the sound of the helicopter's blades as it landed. I'll report just as soon as I can. Well, that won't be necessary, Thomas, Emery yelled back. I'm coming with you. I have to have eyes on the camp to report to the old man. When he stated that, Thomas looked into Emery with, his, with new eyes. He had assumed that Emery was a pencil pusher before, but as he looked him over now, Thomas could see that Emery was wearing a black combat uniform, carrying a, a molly and a 6.5 Creedmoor, just like Owen and Easton and the other men had with him. He replaced his glasses with contacts at some point since they had parted, and his whole demeanor had transformed from, from just an unassuming businessman to a competent operator. He didn't even look like the same person. Well, you're the boss, Thomas yelled his response as they were the last two to enter the chopper. He couldn't help but to think about Harry Murdoch as he entered the loading ramp with Emery. He hoped that his memory wasn't a foreshadowing of future events. As the last of the party's ATVs and supplies were loaded aboard, Thomas commanded Jake to jump up into the Chinook. Fire him up, Emery yelled to the pilots as he pointed with his right hand and twirled around his index finger counterclockwise. Jake could feel the tension in the air and smell the adrenaline as the men inside the helicopter sweated out. He laid down next to Thomas. The next time he touched the ground, he just knew that they were going to play the find the booger game. He was good at that game. He also liked to win. Tonight, he would do his best to find these boogers. He just hoped that these smelled better than those in Mississippi. Anticipation of the game was almost as enjoyable as the actual game to Jake. Since arriving at this location, Jake had experienced a lot of new smells and sounds that he was unfamiliar with. His curiosity had peaked. His confidence had soared. He had never lost a game when he knew the rules. His alpha would tell him the rules when they began the game. Now Jake was excited about this new game. He would win. He knew this because Jake was a good boy. Chapter 6, The Sinclair Party's Camp It was just after sunset before the search team that Thomas led arrived at the Sinclair Party's camp. Owen and the security team immediately began setting up tripwire camp perimeters inside the tree line surrounding the camp. After that, they divided up the area in sectors and set up field cameras to watch each sector and a makeshift command post where his tech operative could keep a vigilant watch on their site. After every operative was clear on his duties, the team split up to cover their sectors with the instructions not to shoot until they were sure that the hostiles weren't Jake. Before setting up their posts, the operatives took the time to organize the four-seater Polaris razors that were offloaded from the Chinook to carry around their equipment and supplies. Each of these customized machines had large enough gas tanks for drive for days. Extra gas cans were attached to the top of the roll cage as well. Thomas placed his training camera on Jake's head and placed Jake's ear comm into his right ear. Then he sent Jake out on a seek and find command so that he could get a better look at what the inside of the canopy looked like. 
When Jake got to the first tree, Thomas cued his microphone and commanded Jake to stop, test the equipment before Jake vanished out of sight. Seeing that the dog stopped on command, Thomas then gave command for Jake to raise his right paw, followed by a release command and then a command to raise his left paw. After successfully executing these commands, Thomas continued to seek command and let Jake do his thing. Now that Jake was on the perimeter search, Thomas finally felt a sense of safety. Now while Thomas had been deploying Jake, Jimmy began looking around for signs to tell him what went wrong. The whole area looked like a herd of elk had come in and trampled everything. There were patches of dried liquid that Jimmy found out to be blood every few yards. There seemed to be way too much blood for the party to have lost. Even all the members together didn't have as much blood combined as Jimmy saw dropped on the ground. He bent down, picked up several leaves that contained dried blood on them, and smelled them. What his nose told him was perplexing. This blood smelled like the iron content was much greater than any known animal that he was aware of. It also contained an oily texture that hadn't let the blood just fully dry yet. Normally, any animal blood that he was familiar with would have dried within, within hours into solid. This blood felt like it melted animal fat. Now Emery went directly to the overturned Jeep Rubicon 4x4 vehicles and studied them for damage and clues. Now one of them was totally wrecked. To him, they actually looked like giant children had used them as a soccer ball. The sides were indented with huge dents that were similar to huge human feet. The tops were crushed down all the way to the level of the steering wheels and the seats. He was beginning to think that his mind was going crazy on him when he noticed the first large footprint in the soft dirt surrounding the vehicle. He took out his measuring tape and his phone. He needed to document this before it was trampled over. Emery called out for Thomas to come over and look at his discovery as he began taking pictures of the footprint, using a $20 bill as a size reference. When Thomas arrived on the scene, he was shocked at the size of the print. The outer diameter of the footprint was 37 and 3 eighths inches long. The width along the ball of the foot was 21 and a quarter inch wide. At the heel, the measurement was 11 inches even. Thomas had never even seen such a track this size. The largest track that he had seen up to this point was around 23 inches long. Now, Jimmy joined the duo shortly after the measurements were finished before Emery was mixing up plaster Paris. As soon as he saw what the two were pouring a mold for, he began looking around for the next prints. The next print was found just over nine feet away. Thomas, Emery asked as he mixed water into his fourth batch of plaster of Paris. Have you ever seen a Sasquatch footprint this big? To be honest with you, Thomas replied, no. The largest one I have ever seen before today was around two feet long. Then he looked at the print again. He pointed out the depth of the footprint. This thing was much bigger than a Sasquatch. The old men of the woods down my way don't get nearly as big as this. These tracks are not from a Sasquatch, Jimmy interrupted. Well, what do you mean, Emery asked. Looky here, Jim pointed to another track. It was that of a large wolf, but the track wasn't stepped on by a rear paw. These are wolf hunters for the face eaters. Wolf hunters are skinwalkers who change from man into wolves. Some change and their animal spirit takes over and they no longer can return to the form of a man. Those are wolf hunters. Wolf hunters are also called Wendigos by the people up north of us because they think that the hunters are spirits. There was a great battle up here of some kind. Much happened in a short period of time. There was a lot of killing. There was a lot of ambushes. There are footprints of humans, many Sasquatch, many wolf hunters, and five of the face eaters. Well, what are face eaters, asked Thomas. Face eaters are much larger than Sasquatch. My grandfather stated that they were always at war with Sasquatch people. They are called face eaters because when they attack, they reach out and grab a man or an animal by the neck and rip out the victim's spinal cord with the head attached and bite off the face first before eating the entire victim. It's not often that someone sees these creatures alone, much less in a confrontation of any kind with others. They usually slip up and grab their quarry. They're huge, so conserving energy is mandatory for them. That's why they have their wolf hunters to search out their prey. 
Now, what do you mean by wolf hunters, Easton asked Jimmy as he overheard the conversation from a f just a few yards away. Today, you would call them werewolves, or what the French call rogoros. They are the face eaters, what, what Jake is to Tom's. So, you mean to tell me, Amory asked for clarification, that the Sinclair party was attacked and eaten by what? A mountain giant? No, answered Jimmy. Most of the party was killed. I can read that much in the land, but not everyone was killed. There are two sets of Sasquatch footprints running through the center of this camp. They both stop just long enough to grab someone or something and carry it off. The trail goes up the mountain towards the northwest. The two tracks may be followed by another human track, but they may have been traveling together. It's hard to tell amongst all these other tracks. I will begin following it as soon as we finish up the camp here. Jimmy led them around the camp as the others began sorting through the rubble, looking for anything that may be of use to him. He stopped at various points and explained what happened by the scuff marks and spent shell casings, broken weaponry when he found it, and also by the blood patterns. There were places where bodies obviously had been lying for a while before being moved. Those areas had sizable pools of blood soaked into the ground. Now, it was obvious that many of the dried pools were too large to be human. Emery smelt a spent cartridge as he looked at one of those places. What does your nose tell you, Jimmy asked him. It tells me that the security detail had copper jacketed silver rounds with steel core, Emery answered. It was fired over a week ago. Well, that's just amazing. Thomas was impressed. And then he went on to ask, how can you figure out all that by smelling the cartridge? Well, the last communication via satellite phone was from Katie Sinclair eight days ago. This is a standard Leviathan International patented casing that all field security operatives are issued when the team is just uncertain about what they're going to encounter. The round was designed to kill anything from werewolves to goblins. Well, theoretically, anyway. And by look all this blood, I would say they are at least partially successful, Jimmy stated. Sir, I need you over here, yelled one of the security operatives who'd been investigating the camper attached to the first Rubicon. Owen and Easton arrived soon after Thomas, Emery, and Jimmy to see the mangled bodies of Marshall Black, Jim Waller, and Caden Downs being cut out of the crushed can of a camper. The three were identified by their name tags more than by visual recognition. The cool air of the campsite had helped to keep back the decomposition, but the multitude of insects in the area had begun their job as cleaners for the wilderness. The smell of the bodies was just gut-wrenching. Emery took out a Vicks inhalant, container rubbed the salve under his nose, and breathed in several breaths of the contents through each nostril. He then passed around to those within reach. As two of the security team brought out body bags and began the grotesque job of recovering the deceased bodies, Jimmy noticed another print on the ground. Now, this print was much smaller than the first one Emery found. It was only about 18 inches long. And he noticed that within the larger print, there was a slightly smaller print within the first print. The two prints were distinguishable because the ground under the smaller print was deeper than that of the larger print. Now, Jimmy backtracked the trail of the larger print. It stopped at a pool of blood near the tree line. As he turned to look back, he saw that the tracks ran straight through the center of the camp. It was joined by the smaller tracks about 25 feet from the tree line. Both tracks converged until the individuals made their way to the center of the camp. There is where Jimmy saw where the larger individual picked up two humans with smaller footprints. He surmised that they were the women, Kate Sinclair and Mary Ann Wright. They were clearly abducted. The smaller Sasquatch individual had grabbed up two men. Although he didn't know which two men he'd grabbed, he did hope that they were Kevin Sinclair and Eric Grant. Everyone in the expedition wore the same patterned shoe treads, so it was relatively impossible to distinguish each member apart except for the actual size of the shoe. However, on the ground near the tracks of the kidnapped men, there were 45 automatic Colt pistol casings. It was known that Kevin Sinclair had a Kimber 45 ACP pistol. Mixed among the casings, there was a name tag that said Eric Grant on it. It also had the Leviathan International logo and his company position as an advisor on it. 
And while Thomas was watching Jimmy and Emery investigate the murder scene, Jake's ear calm and camera alerted on Thomas's digital notebook. As he checked out the information, he received the GPS coordinates for about 500 yards uphill from them towards the northwest. And as he opened the video feed, he saw a hand patting the top of the head on Jake. When he turned up the volume of the video feed, there was a message. Whoever is on the other end of this camera, the gruff, masculine voice said, My name is John Wilson Tate. I'm a forward scout for an expedition funded by Lathiathon International. I need help. He then gave his GPS coordinate. Thomas gave Jake the command to stay, and he called over everyone within hearing distance. He replayed the message, and Owen quickly assembled a team to go return John Wilson to the camp. When the team left, others began setting up a a makeshift triage tent. Emery took the time to call in the Chinook for transporting the recovered cadavers and John Wilson to the main base in safety. When the team got out of sight, Tom Thomas used his camera and Jake to look for them by commanding Jake to turn around and listen for their approach. When the team arrived, Jake stood protectively over the unconscious John Wilson until Thomas gave him the command to stand down so that the team could evaluate him and exfiltrate him from the vantage point. Thomas gave Jake the command to return to camp when the team began leaving John Wilson's hiding place. He stayed with the team until they returned to the Sinclair camp. And once at camp, John Wilson was immediately given an intravenous bag of fluid to help with his dehydration. He was conscious and lucid in thought and speech, even if he was exhausted beyond most men's limits. He laid there on the gurney and was very stoic as the medical team looked over his injuries. He had multiple contusions on his legs, back, and shoulders. He had a large gash on the rib cage that he had packed with mud and moss, and he had received a hard blow on the head at one point that had bled inside the unbroken skin and just created an intradermal bloody scab. His eyes were bloodshot from a lack of sleep. His hands and feet had defensive wounds on them as well as his shins and his forearms. His clothing had seen better days. It was plain to see that John Wilson had been through his own personal hell. After John Wilson was treated and given a mild sedative, Emery asked him for any information that he could give him about what had happened during the catastrophic last moments in camp. John Wilson told in precise detail what happened in a way that only soldiers experienced in battle could understand. Luckily, Everyone there but Thomas and Jimmy were former military soldiers and followed along with his account just right. John Wilson told how they had seemingly uneventful expedition until they decided to camp at their current location for the night. John Wilson told him how just about at dusk after he had returned to camp to eat his evening meal, the whole camp heard of just an indescribable yell coming from around the mountainside to the northeast. At least that is where they thought that the sound originated. He grabbed his rifle. He then went on to describe the incident of the creature charging the camp. He spoke of the creature talking in broken English that danger was coming. Then all hell broke loose, he stated. John Wilson went on to tell about the arrival of the wolf-like creatures that attacked the camp. He told about the carnage and how everyone began firing at once. As the battle raged, he noticed that more of the Sasquatch arrived and were actually fighting the werewolf. Then, out of the wilderness appeared five very large humanoids. The biggest one was almost 30 feet tall. The other four were smaller, but the smallest one was still around 18 or 19 feet tall. Now those creatures being, began grabbing up any dead body and eating them, he stated. They ate humans, they ate the Sasquatch, and werewolves just indiscriminately. John Wilson went on to say that he saw the first creature charge the women and carry them off towards the direction that they had found him away from the camp. The second smaller Sasquatch grabbed Kevin and Eric and followed the larger one away from the battle. When he saw the large one grab Katie, John Wilson said that he began to give them pursuit, but they were just way too fast for him to keep up. He was in the process of running uphill after him while engaging the werewolves when he was hit from behind and rolled down the mountain into a drainage crack where where Jake had found him. Twice the giants tried to get to him, but each time he was able to shoot them at close range with his 6.5 millimeter Creedmoor in the face, 
and dissuade them from continuing after him. He passed out intermittently during his ordeal. John Wilson said that the only reason that he was able to survive was the fact that every morning dew from the mountain ran down to a break in a small stream that he used, and he used his water bladder from his molly to catch enough to keep himself partially hydrated. John Wilson never heard the Chinook land. He couldn't believe that Jake had actually arrived and found him. He ended his account by stating that anyone not found beyond the four that were kidnapped were just completely consumed. He stated that he, he saw firsthand when some of the operatives were killed. Now, those that survived the werewolf attack were grabbed up by the mountain giants and had their heads and backbones ripped from their bodies, he told them. Then their faces had been bitten off and their bodies were consumed. Some of the men were captured alive and bitten in half and swallowed while still screaming. John Wilson recounted he was reasonably certain that Kate Mary Ann, Kevin, and Eric were grabbed and carried away for their own safety. John Wilson made that assumption because of the words of warning that were spoken by the Sasquatch that arrived just before the attack. Also, there were other Sasquatch that arrived to help fend off the attack. And once the battle was over, all the cryptids vanished back into the wilderness except for a few Sasquatch who remained to clean up the dead and dispatch the wounded. Even though John Wilson was a battle-hardened Marine, he said that the battle was completely brutal and uncivilized in its horrors. Do you have any idea about the direction that the Sasquatch took while carrying them off? asked Thomas. Well, I only have an educated guess, John Wilson answered as he was being loaded up in the helicopter. I was following them northwest in a beeline for that mountain just past the first pass over there. John Wilson pointed at the mountain that he was referring to. I was only about five feet on the left side of their trail when I fell into that drainage ditch, he stated, before ending with, you shouldn't have much problem finding their trail since all those werewolves and mountain giants followed them after destroying the camp. There was a hell of a fight up there as well. It was still going on when I fell into the ditch and hit my head. The strangest part of the whole ordeal is that I swear that I heard singing or chanting while the fight was at its worst. With that, John Wilson, the two medics, and the three body bags were loaded into the Chinook and lifted out to the main base. Emery kept one of the medics' medical bags after trading his molly for it, and as the helicopter rose up to a safe flying altitude, the rotor wash blew everything that wasn't tied down around the camp. Thomas looked toward the mountain that John Wilson referred to as the pilot flew the Chinook out of sight. He didn't know what this night was going to reveal to himself and his companions, but they had to be ready for just about anything. As he thought about what John Wilson had conveyed to them, Thomas wondered how much was accurate and how much was misconception of what happened due to John Wilson's head injury. Either way, he would probably know by morning. Everything that he had heard tonight was alien to what he had encountered in Mississippi. His experiences had led him to believe the Sasquatch was just an unrecognized great ape. Could it be that the term Sasquatch referred to more than just one type of hominid? Could there be so many undiscovered large primates living apart from civilization? If so, how did they manage to hide from satellite imagery and air traffic? And as always, his discoveries caused him to develop more questions and answers. The rabbit hole just became a black hole. And while Thomas was observing the mountain, Owen, Easton, and three more of the security operatives turned the second Rubicon back up onto its wheels. After unhitching the mangled camper that was attached to it, an inspection showed that the only real damage to the vehicle was cosmetic. After checking the fluids, they found that the oil and transmission fluids had drained out, but the brake and power steerings were still full. A quick check of the owner's manual told the operatives how much fluid that Jeep needed. Another quick search of the camper revealed the needed fluids and four five-gallon gas tanks. While the crew was attending the Rubicon, Thomas directed Jimmy to scout ahead in the direction of the mountains where the Sasquatch disappeared and see if he could find their trail. He gave Jake the guard signal and pointed at Jimmy and ordered Jake to stay with him. Jimmy reached down and scratched Jake's head and invited him along with a good old good look see. Jack had never played his game with Jimmy before. He hoped Jimmy was as willing to reward his success with ear scratches, just like he was used to getting from Thomas. 
Anticipating another game, Jake was compliant and followed out ahead. At 160 pounds and almost seven feet long from nose to tail, Jake executed confidence that he would win this game. Back in Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, and Tennessee, he had won this game. No other animal who played this game with him in the past had ever eluded him. Even though he has experienced so many new smells and tastes, Jake knows what the game is always the same. Thomas gives him one scent. Jake filters through every other scent and picks out the right trail and away they go. As the two went out to scout ahead, Thomas hoped that they didn't run into anything dangerous. His mind was focused on face eaters, Sasquatches, and werewolf. At this point, he didn't consider bear, mountain lion, or cougars dangerous. Even a pack of normal timber wolves didn't seem as much of a challenge as these hunter wolves he heard about. Chapter 7, Auric Up in the mountains above the tree line, Auric reigned supreme. His existence had spread across many centuries. Long ago, Auric had quit observing his birth date. His great size allowed him to intimidate any would-be challenger until Gawa had come along. At the height of 54 feet, he weighed just a little over four tons. It was Auric who had conquered the woven tribes and subjugated them to become his slaves. If he was honest with himself, the woven hunters had sustained him for many years now. Advanced age had created physical problems that he hadn't foreseen. His eyes were not as clear as they once were. His hearing wasn't as attuned as it used to be. His joints creaked a lot lately. His hands had lost much of their strength, and he was continually wary of falling. He spent more time sitting on his stone throne these days than he actually spent doing anything else besides eating what his hunters brought to him. His lower back seemed like he had lost the will to hold up the torso. It was his oldest son, Gawa, who first noticed these maladies. Gawa, being the son of his father, had decided that Oruk was past his prime. He began his campaign to become the next king of the mountain. He went to his younger brother and convinced them to support him in his effort to dethrone their father. Oruk had seen the campaign for what it was. He had also decided that he no longer wished to hold the responsibility of the family's well-being on his stooping shoulders. Oric knew that by birthright, Gawa was the natural choice to become his heir to his position. In Oric's opinion, Gawa was the only one strong enough and capable of maintaining control over the woven hunters who seemed to become more obstinate as of late. On the eve of the day in which Gawa had decided to kill his father, Oric called Gawa and his extended family to him. Sitting up in the stone throne that his body had worn smooth over the centuries, Oric announced to all that he was abdicting his throne and that Gawa was to be his successor. In order for Gawa to prove his ability to lead their people, he had to organize a truce for peace between the mountain people and the Sasquatch. This had never been accomplished in his entire reign. His intention was that either Gawa would be defeated by the rebel Da or that a peace would be ensured for his retirement. As Oric publicly gave Gawa a lawful way to gain his greatest wish, Gawa could no longer try to overthrow Oric. If he attempted to kill his father after his father gave him a chance to honorably take his place, he would become a pariah of this world. Every giant who saw him would be obligated to kill him. It was ancient law. Therefore, Gawa placed his time and energy in solving the problem that was presented to him. It was Gawa's idea to challenge Da. It was also Gawa's idea to let Da defeat him after a hard-fought battle so that Da felt as if the treaty between them was Da's doing. He spoke with Oric about his plan. Oric had agreed that it may work. He assured Gawa that if Gawa would orchestrate his plan and successfully execute it, he would then be king. Two days later, Gawa traveled down the mountains to challenge Da to a battle for peace. Should Da win, the mountain people would stay above the tree line. Should Gawa win, the Sasquatch people must move down to the plains and completely out of the mountains. Any Sasquatch caught in the mountains after Da's loss would be considered hostile and hunted down and eaten. If Da won, any face eater or hunter found inside Da's domain was fair game as well. 
According to Gawa's plan, Da eventually won the battle. The peace was agreed upon and terms were given and accepted. Gawa had not only tricked Da into thinking that he had won the battle honestly, but he had also ensured the peace and seized the throne honorably. Oric was enjoying his peace and quiet as he watched the peaceful valley below him, and after a short while he noted a disruption on the horizon. As he squinted his ancient eyes, he saw hunters running back towards his mountain as if they were being pursued by some unseen force. They were running as fast as they could without looking back, even once. Something must be awry for them to be acting in this manner, he thought. He looked towards the back of the pack to see if he could spy Gawa or one of his four grandsons among the pack. None of them were present. A knot forming in his stomach as he tried to figure out why the hunters would leave his son in such a haste that they even never looked back to see if Gawa was safe. A feeling of foreboding weighed on Oric's mind. Oric didn't have long to wait before he got the answer that he needed. One of the beta hunters ran straight to him and bowed on his knees and dropped his muzzle to his chest. You have something to tell me, Oric stated. Yes, the leader of the pack answered but remained silent. You fear to be the bearer of this message, slave? Oric asked authoritatively. You will be in greater danger of harm if you refuse to tell me what I demand you to say. My lord, the hunter began. I must tell you that in the past four days, your son, mighty Gawa, and his four princes have been murdered by Dene, son of Da, and his warriors. What? roared Oric in disbelief. How is this possible? Out of anger, Oric grabbed the messenger and ripped him in half, throwing his lifeless body to the ground. For the next few minutes, he threw a temper tantrum fueled by anger in his grief. As his old body began to wear down and his breath became ragged, he finally gathered himself up and sat back down on the throne that he had just recently given to his son. Pointing to another hunter, he asked him to explain how his son and his grandsons met their untimely death. Standing well outside of the face eater king's grasp, the hunter went on to describe how the pack had come upon the humans and their machines wandering aimlessly in the wilderness. They were so noisy and created so many interesting sounds and smells that their leader reported them to Gawa. Gawa decided that the expedition was to be captured so that the humans could be eaten and their magics revealed. Upon returning to report their discovery, the pack had come across Daw on the trail. He was enraged that the pack was traveling in his domain without permission, so he confronted him. The pack dogpiled him and held him down as their leaders held the nose and mouth of Daw shut until his breath refused to enter his body and his spirit left for his journey to the Sky People. The pack reported Da's demise to Gawa, so Gawa decided that the peace treaty was no longer in effect. He led the pack and his sons down to the human camp. While they were just passing a tree line, the whole pack heard Da scream in a challenge to Gawa. Gawa was disturbed, but since he knew that he allowed Da to win this battle for peace, he continued on to the human village. He found Dene at the human camp. Gawa sent in the hunters and a battle ensued. Then other Sasquatch appeared to help defend the human village until the hunters overran the site. All the humans were killed at this village. Three locked themselves inside a wagon and refused to come out, so Gawa crushed them inside their shelter. After that, the Sasquatch people retreated and the hunters gave chase. Gawa and his sons finished off the human male warriors, but Dene and his younger brother Babu grabbed the two women and two men who were leading the humans and ran away. Gawa wanted them as well, so he ordered the hunters to track them down. They tracked the Sasquatch and their captives to their lair. Once the hunters found the Sasquatch stronghold, they attacked it, but they were met with strong resistance. Dene was fighting the hunters until Gawa arrived. Then Dene challenged Gawa. The hunters backed away to let the two leaders fight. Gawa walked to meet the challenge. Dene ran down the mountain, jumped off a cliff, and attacked Gawa's neck. Dene ripped out Gawa's throat, then jumped to Jawa and viscerated him with his claws as he slid down Jawa's stomach. The other three sons of Gawa attacked Dene together, but he killed them with his bare hands. He killed them together, not one at a time, but all as one. When the hunters saw the mighty Gawa and his sons were all defeated and killed, they rushed back here to bring Oric the bad news. Where are the bodies? Oric asked. 
Unless they have been moved by the Sasquatch people, they remain where they lay slain, answered the hunters. Take enough hunters to bring back Gawa's body, Orit commanded. Then go back for my grandsons. Bring them all back, even if they're just in pieces. We will hold a commemorative banquet in their honor. Immediately, the pack left to return to the site of their fallen king and his princes. None of the pack had any illusions that the mission that they were sent out on was anything short of a suicide mission. But their master gave them a command. Their pack mentality instinctively obeyed despite the probability of personal individual injury or death. Failure wasn't considered an option as they knew that failure would mean certain death. After the pack was out of sight of the face eater cave, the leader called for them to stop and take a rest break. They had been running for a long time uphill on their return to their home. Now, even though they were running downhill, they were all exhausted. The morning star was about to set, and daylight was just beginning to break the horizon. After finding a familiar cave, they retreated inside to bathe in the inner pool and rest during the daylight hours. Their task wasn't going to run away from them. If the Sasquatch people eat them before they arrive, at least they tried. The hunters would never have the nerve to openly disobey their masters, but in his absence, they didn't find fault with slacking on their job as long as they could do it and not worry about getting punished. And since Oric began showing his advanced age, Alpha became complacent with his duties. Now that he was miles away from Oric, who really wasn't the king, he didn't have an issue with taking his time and ensuring that his hunters were rested before they continued their task. Also, if he gave the Sasquatch time to clean up the battlegrounds, he would have a legitimate reason why he couldn't drag the stinking carcasses of Gawa and his sons back to the highlands. Well, friends, that's a sensational story. It's turning into something that's way different than what we've been reading and hearing about. But uh, it's interesting, so we'll, we'll read a few more and see how they turn out. Joe Flippo's an energetic writer, so we thank him for his stories. And, and it's always good to listen to a good old story around a campfire. So, by golly, next time I see you, I'll read you another couple chapters of this story, and we'll see where she goes. Till then, good night, everybody. This is Clay Steele.